On uh, the question as to whether or not uh, legal content uh, exists before construction occurs, uh, what I want to say, first of all, just in terms of the technical way the paper handles this problem, I choose the word determine here deliberately so as to be neutral as between two different things that occur. So one thing is that uh, uh, given constraint, given constraint, uh, uh, when the linguistic meaning or, or communicative content more properly uh, uh, is clear, then uh, you can discover legal content, right? You discover legal content based on a pre-existing communicative content and a pre-existing practice or rule of constraint. That, that content's already there. But, but not all of legal content is like that, right? Some legal content is not already there. Uh, at least if you accept uh, as a fact that uh, the language of the Constitution is not fully determinate. That is, if you accept that at least some constitutional language underdetermines legal content and legal effect. Right? And, and the examples that seem most obvious are the broad, abstract, and general provisions of the Constitution. And you don't have to be Dworkin and think that they refer to general concepts, even if they are particular conceptions of those concepts, uh, they will not be fully determinant, right? But th that's a separate issue. Uh, in that case, what do courts do? Well, they can do lots of things. There could be a default rule, in which case there would be pre-existing law provided by the pre-existing default rule. But another option is precisification and that's the way courts frequently handle these problems of underdetermination. That's frequently how they provide content in the construction zone. Precisification does not pre-exist the activity. The activity creates the precisification. Okay, so um, thanks. That's very, very helpful, really, really helpful, and I will make sure uh, that that uh, the ambiguity Mitch detects is explicated in in future in 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 whatever happens to this paper, but also in all future work. Okay, contemporary public meaning. Uh, you know you you know what I'm going to say about this, right? And Mitch sort of already said it for me. Um, yes, uh, if we're talking about just meaning in the linguistic sense. There are different kinds of meaning in the linguistic sense, including contemporary reader's meaning. In fact, there's the meaning that every reader has, which may be completely idiosyncratic as well. There's lots of meanings in that sense. Um, uh, that's why I want to use the phrase communicative content, right, which picks out a particular kind of linguistic meaning, the meaning communicated by the text, right? So the real question is, why is that meaning important, right? And the whole point of sort of the generalized version of the fixation thesis is to show us that that is a particularly important and salient kind of meaning that we search for all the time when we read texts. So if we're reading 13th century letters, there could be a fun activity, right? Where we take the 13th century letter and we ask contemporary readers who know nothing about linguistic practices in the 13th century and nothing about the context in which the letter was written, what does it mean, right? Great, you know, that's, that is a, that's a possible activity, could be lots of fun. And as Mitch points out, and this is very helpful too, thank you again, Mitch, there might be 
a normative theory of constitutional construction that says we ought to use this ahistorical meaning with respect to the constitutional text just because it provides a coordination point that's natural because that's the way contemporary readers are inclined to read the words. That's true. That's a question as to what meaning we should be constrained by. That's not communicative content, right? It's a different meaning, but we could have a legal, it'd be very odd legal practice in my, in my, in my, uh, in my opinion, but we, it's a possible legal practice, right? But that's just another debate. So um, uh, uh, that point aside, right, and that point does not deny the fixation thesis. It simply points that there's another thing we could go for in constitutional practice. As I understand Mitch's remarks, he does not deny the fixation thesis. So that's what I was hoping for. Uh, we have uh, an extensive queue, but maybe it won't take the whole uh, whole time. So if you still want to get on, um, signal, signal me. Um, and our first, uh, there's no good word. Triad is, is a system of weapons of mass destruction. Trio is folk musicians. Threesome, I'm not even going to go there. So, so, so our, our, our first group of three um, is Sam Rickless, uh, Steve Sachs, and John Ollendorf. Just two, one quick point and one more important point. So uh, you say the concept conception distinction assumes that words like good have multiple senses. I don't think that that's how philosophers of language would look at this. Um, you, you know, take the, take the uh, sentence drugs are good for you as long as they are pleasurable. If you have a particular conception of goodness as pleasure, um, that would be, on your view, because the the sense of the word good would just be, would just mean the same as pleasure and that would have the same sense, then that would just turn out to be a tautology. So I don't think that's, that's right. Also, you wouldn't get disagreement. So if I say that's good and you say that's not good, then um, if, and, and you think that in most cases we're actually using uh, the conception sense rather than the general almost empty sense when we're using it and talking to each other, then we wouldn't be disagreeing because I would be meaning one thing, so to speak, and you would be meaning something else. Okay, so that's, that's the first point. Second point, um, I'm going to take a, uh, a leaf out of Jack Balkin's book here. I hope, if, if you'll, excuse me, Jack. Um, take a leaf. Okay. <laughs> so you might have thought that words like speech and Congress meant speech and Congress, but actually, on some views, they don't, right? Uh, so Congress shall make no law. It's really not about Congress. It's about any branch of government, uh, depending on the context in which you're finding the word Congress. So it turns out that communicative content, at least for some, depends on the literal versus, versus depends on literal versus non-literal usage. So you have to decide whether the usage is literal or non-literal before you can fix the communicative content. Now ask yourself, what is it that fixes whether the usage is literal or non-literal? Uh, now, according to uh, Balkan Knight, um, I'm not sure I am, but suppose you took that view, um, whether a word is being used literally or non-literally is determined by underlying principles that make the best sense of the provision in its overall context or something like that. Um, and now let me ask, you know, suppose the context changes, whether it's the textual context or some other context. Um, if the context changes and whether a word is being used literally or non-literally depends on its on the underlying on the principles that underlie that make the best sense of the context, then it turns out that you could have changes to the context. I don't know amendments, additions, deletions, what have you, that change then the best underlying principles, which then change whether a word is best read literally or non-literally, and so then end up changing the communicative content. And then, so that's a challenge to the fixation thesis. I'm done. Steve. So, um, I enjoyed the paper and want to follow up on a few comments on, uh, w that Mitch gave. When I was reading the paper, one thing that occurred to me is the, the debate on, you know, does Chevron have only one step? Um, 
And the reason is because one might say, you know, does, uh, does your take on originalism have two theses or only one? Um, we say that there's fixation, that the communicative content is, you know, original, it's fixed at the time of enactment or utterance. And then there's constraint, which is the communicative content constraints. Now one could also just change that to one thesis, namely the original communicative content constraints. And what you drop out when you do that is the reliance on a particular privileged individual communicative content. Um, and so now there's a reason to do it in two steps because it has the attraction of sort of dividing and conquering. Yeah, it sounds pretty plausible that the communicative content is original in nature. And yeah, it sounds pretty plausible that the communicative content constrains, but it might sound less plausible if you could do it all at once. Um, and in particular, I want to sort of echo what Mitch said, that often what we mean by, when, when we use meaning, and even I think when we use communicative content, it sort of depends on what you want to know. Um, sometimes what we're interested in is trying to figure out a person's intent. So we're reading a 13th century letter, we want to know what the author of that letter was trying to tell us. Sometimes we're interested in public meetings. So you see the label on food that says fat free, Maybe the author, who doesn't speak English well, was honestly trying to tell us that the fat is all free and we're only being charged for the rest of it. But the <laughs> FDA is still not going to let them sell that candy bar because they care about something else other than the author's intended meaning. Sometimes we care about contemporary public meaning. So imagine Colonel Chaucer's Canterbury Fried Chicken made with 100% deer. <laughs> Since the 13th century, same recipe. And every box has on a label a little picture of Colonel Chaucer and his, you know, statement in his handwriting made with 100% deer. So in that situation, again, the FDA is going to say you can't sell that and say it's made with 100% deer because what we care about is not his intentions. It's not the, the contemporary, sort of contemporary to him, the original public meeting. It's what the public meeting is to people who buy the chicken today. And... My worry is that in your attempt to be relatively ecumenical about different theories of communicative content, in some ways you do flirt with tautology. Because until the talk, I didn't really know, I mean, you, you said sort of communicative content is the payload delivered by the text, it's the meaning communicated by the text. Those definitions don't actually show up in the paper. And we don't actually have a definition of a communication. Now I think that a lot of the work done by the paper is the intuition that a communication is done by somebody trying to tell me stuff. And if I want to know what I should take from this, it's the stuff they were trying to tell me. It's sort of a Gricean speaker's uh, meaning intuition. Now, you, 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 I'm sure, resist that reading. But I think that a lot of it, um, a lot of the, the moves in the paper echo it. So on you know, page 16, we talk about how authors and speakers attempt to convey meaning. Uh, and attempts are necessarily intentional actions. We talked about how on page 18, we can convey meaning, but it only makes sense that we're the ones doing it if it somehow relates very specifically to us as opposed to what another person using the same expressions in the public context uh, might say. And I think that um, your response on 49 and 50 to the contemporary public meaning approach recapitulates all the criticism someone like Larry Alexander would make of original public meaning approach. Namely, we have to have some way of determining what evidence is relevant to the inter interpreter, what information is to be considered by the hypothetical group of contemporary readers, which is exactly, I think, what Larry would say about how we have difficulty figuring out the original public meaning because we need to know what information the hypothetical original public reader gets to have in figuring out intentions. So w one attempt that the paper makes to overcome this is with the, the type token distinction to, to sort of show why no, 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 really is the original stuff that matters because we're interested in that utterance, not another utterance today. Though I think that even that has trouble with the Colonel Chaucer example because if the, if the meaning, I mean, you could say, look, the token we're talking about is the old utterance by Colonel Chaucer, just like we read this as if it were the utterance of, you know, the framers at Philadelphia, not a publication by the Cato Institute relatively recently. Um, and so to the extent that we're taking all of these copies of the Constitution and saying, you know, what does this mean? We really are, um, you know, looking back to that, you know, we're, we're, we're not, um, the, the, the claims about contemporary meaning can't be defeated by saying, oh, what we're really talking about is only that old document there, because 
you still have the same problem when you have additional copies that are recently produced. So my worry is that unless we have a fuller notion of what you mean by communication, um, it's going to be very hard to say why um, contemporary public meaning has to be excluded. John. Um, so, uh, so I think this is an excellent paper. I think it's a laudably careful paper. Um, so my comment was going to be about sort of the different types of meaning, but that comment was entirely preempted by Mitch, which I take to either be a compliment to me or an unfortunate lapse for Mitch. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I would just reiterate that I think on, on page 14, you move much too quickly from meaning to communicative content. Um, but and so instead, I want to push you on your response to Mitch's first uh, point about whether there's pre-existing law. Um, because I take this to sort of go to my question yesterday for Steve about uh, when contribution happens. Um, so my understanding of, of your uh, view of the constraint principle had been that that you take sort of the traditional view that contribution happens at the time of application. Um, and if that's the case, and I think Mitch is right, uh, there doesn't seem to be any pre-existing law until, until the application. Um, now, your response to Mitch, I take it, is that sort of in cases where the communicative content is not under determinant, that's doing all the work, so there is sort of pre-existing law. But that just doesn't square with with my understanding of your take on the interpretation construction distinction, which is that, uh, which I thought was that whenever, or even in cases of a, of a perfectly determinate text, there's still a little work to do uh, for, for, uh, for construction to translate uh, communicative content into, into legal meaning. And so even if it's sort of perfectly determinate what the legal content is going to be until contribution has happened, um, there isn't pre-existing legal meaning. So I just sort of want your view on, on this question of when, when contribution happens. All right. Thanks. Sam. Thank you for the first point. It's obviously right. Uh, the second point, so, so the way you develop this, the principles that make sense of er, whatever, the, the First Amendment, right? Um, I'm not quite, uh, that's obviously not a full-blown theory, right? It's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's just a, a it, it's actu it actually was only uh, uh, five words, right? So one way of interpreting that phrase is that you are um, uh, assuming a Dworkinian perspective. Right, that the meaning of a text is the uh, constructive interpretation says is the meaning that makes the text the best normatively that it can be. Right, so um, that's the issue that I'm just bracketing today. Right, because we we really would have to get into that theory. Um, second possibility is that you don't intend to invoke Dworkin. And what you're saying is that we are just trying to make sense of the word Congress, and then context will be relevant to that. Uh, and uh, taking context into account, we might conclude that Congress is a uh, synecdoche. Thank you, Jack, for teaching me how to pronounce that. Um, City in New York. Yeah, synecdoche, New York. So, um, in principle, of course it could be, right? There's nothing, you can't rule out this possibility. Um, I don't think, if it is a synecdoche, and then I think that uh, that's what it is. And it doesn't suddenly spring into a synecdoche later when we discover that it would be a good idea to have a First Amendment that applied to things other than Congress. Now, just my view, just on the merits, right, just because I think this clarifies things, my view is that it's not, that it refers only to Congress, right? The First Amendment's original meaning does not apply to anything else. But then there's lots of other ways that the Constitution might handle that problem. For example, it might handle that problem via the Ninth Amendment. That, and, and I think that a good case could be made that this kind of thing, 
right, uh, uh, the First Amendment being limited to Congress, uh, 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 but the same underlying uh, a conception of a right of political morality, obviously applying to other things, could provide a sort of minimum content to the Ninth Amendment uh, that doesn't run into some of the inkblot problems that you get when you try to go beyond those contexts. But that's really just the details of the example. But thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, very helpful comments. Uh, 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 Steve Sachs. Um, so I, I see two comments here, right? One is the running into that, that I'm trying to separate out linguistic meaning or communicative content, right, from legal content or legal effect, and they could be combined, right? And what I want to s insist on but maybe we need to talk about this more. It's obviously a deep issue that goes beyond this paper. What I want to insist on is that the communicative content and the legal effect or legal content, although they are obviously related in extraordinarily important ways, are really two different things. And that when you mush them together, you inevitably get conceptual confusion, right? That the mushing together of the legal content and the communicative content is just an invitation to thinking that is confused, right? So that's my position on this issue. And you know, it's, I've got a separate paper called Legal Content and Communicative Content and a two papers on the interpretation construction distinction. It's obviously a big topic. Second topic, the Grice topic, right? So I, th um, I think you misunderstand my position. My position is neo-Gricean, right? It does include intent. It is actually, I think, consistent with Larry's position at terms of the deep theoretical structure. The reason that I think we get public meaning originalism is because of the context of constitutional communication or the communicative situation uh, in which uh, that communication takes place. The Constitution is a document, this is contestable, right, but in my opinion, is a document addressed to the public at large, right, to the people uh, under conditions in which particularized information about the uh, communicative intentions of specific drafters is not available, right? That means that it, you have a context in which you are limited to information to communicate successfully, you have to communicate using information that's available to the public. The people who write the Constitution know that. The people who read the Constitution know that. That's, in other words, Gricean reflexivity, or game theorists call it common knowledge, right? That is the communicative setup. That is why original intentions, originalism, understood in a Gricean way and public meaning originalism are consistent. Um, so uh, uh, thank you for that. I, I, I understand I need to write a paper on this point exactly, and, and I will. Um, John. Uh, so so I, I just, I, I, you know, we're talking now about the metaphysics of legal content. When does it exist, right? Um, and uh, uh, you can certainly imagine describing this in different ways, even though we agree totally on the phenomena, right? So one description is, uh, even when it's clear, 
right? Because there is a possibility that you could depart from the clear meaning, even though there's a pre-existing constraint principle that's recognized within the legal culture, the legal content does not spring into existence until after the act of application occurs, right? That would be one position in the metaphysics, the temporal metaphysics of legal content. And then there's another description of the exact same phenomena. All the phenomena are exactly the same, and we say, well, given that the practice is settled, and given that the communicative content is clear, then we can describe this situation as one in which the legal content existed before the act of construction. The construction is really just recognizing it. There is always the possibility that the construction would go in a different way, right? But in those circumstances, we'd be more inclined to describe that as a change in legal content, right? Rather than there was no prior legal content and uh, the only legal content that there ever was, uh, was inconsistent with constraint and the meaning of the text. So I, I think I can be neutral as between the two positions in the temporal metaphysics of legal content, right? They both describe the same thing. I don't think it makes any difference to the substance of my claims. So um, now Mitch may disagree with this uh, uh, on other grounds, and I know that um, uh, he has some very particular concerns about how this might play out in terms of impl implementation rules. But just bracketing that for a moment, I don't think it makes a difference to me. I was going to use neutral terminology, but the next group is really a troika um, uh, uh, consisting of Steve Smith, uh, Myron Schwarzschild, and Larry Alexander. So with a, with a final, final plaintive and probably futile plea for brevity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a friendly question or almost like a request for instruction, further instruction or something like this. Um, and it might be too basic to, you know, if so, just tell me, you know, to, you know explain some other time. But um, so I like the part of the paper where you were responding to Dworkin and the concept conception move and so forth. Um, it seemed to me that uh, you accepted his basic framework. There are concepts, and then there are conceptions, and then there are expected applications. and um, and uh, as between the way Dworkin treats that and you do, I find your version more sensible and persuasive, so I liked it. Um, but even to make that kind of judgment, I have to sort of suspend some doubt or suspend some incomprehension and so forth, because whenever I read those sort of discussions, I always think, I just don't know what these things are. So maybe this is a question, again, about kind of like the metaphysics of concepts and conceptions and so forth. But I keep thinking, you know, what are we really talking about here? In what sense do these things exist? So, I mean, they could just be like mental states. But I don't think I or probably most people who say, well, I've got a concept of justice and then I've got a conception of, or maybe some other conceptions of justice and sometimes I'm talking about one. That, that seems like an odd way to describe people's mental states. Or, or it could be some sort of... A lot of times the discussions almost sound like there's some platonic essence of justice, and then there are various sorts of conceptions of that, and we might be referring to the platonic reality, or we might be referring to different conceptions. But that seems really odd, too. So I just wonder if you could clarify. Uh, as I say, if I suspend my incomprehension there, and there are these things, just then yours sounds like the more plausible version of it. But I'm not very confident about that because I just don't know what you know what those things are. So, yeah. um, I, I I don't mean to be unfriendly, um, <laughs> but uh, s suppose I'm a living constitutionalist, and I think constitutional interpretation is constitutional adjudication. But it's not just me; um, that's conventional language, civics high school civics, you know, the judicial branch interprets the law, um, which means not that it's doing literary interpretation, but that it's adjudicating cases. Um, and that there's, a, 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 in, interpretation is different in different contexts. There's almost a, a Michael Walzer 
different spheres of interpretation. So there's literary interpretation, which is probably fixed communicative content. There's biblical interpretation, which might not be. There's constitutional interpretation, which is contested. And originalists say it should be along originalist lines. We, um, living constitutionalists, say uh, originalism has legitimate weight, but there are other things, you know, fit structure, precedent, doing the right thing, all that stuff, which have legitimate weight too. <coughs> Comes now Larry Solom, um, who says, let's make a distinction, or perhaps revive an old distinction, um, between uh, interpretation as communicative content, fixed meaning, uh, on the one hand, and construction, that's adjudication. Um, and uh, the, the, that's where the real legal results are going to be. Um, and in this paper, Larry seems to be uh, very magnanimous about legal results, or at least <coughs> kicking the can firmly down the road. Um, so um, he, he's sort of saying, uh, you, leave, you, you, living, uh, you live, living constitutionalists, you might have very good mm -hmm. arguments for your non-originalist construction in any given constitutional case. And of course, you're free to make your arguments. Original interpretation doesn't foreclose you at all as to constitutional construction. Um, isn't that actually putting a heavy rhetorical finger on the scale in behalf of originalist construction fixed fixated uh, construction, uh, putting us um, uh, constitutional, uh, 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 living constitution people in a position of conceding interpretation, uh, which normally means adjudication, um, and saying, well, we're for such and such a construction in this case, but of course, uh, that's contrary to the correct interpretation of the constitution. Um, and in a sense that it's all the more worrisome given how magnanimous um, you're, magnanimously you're phrasing this. Um, you know, it's a, 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 a frightening us that we're dealing with, with a, a car sale here. Um, <laughs> the, the, so the, the, the invitation to accept this distinction, especially if you call communicative content interpretation, uh, is an invitation which we might not be inclined or obliged to accept. Larry. Yeah, well, I, I quite like the paper. I mean, in, in, in a sense, you know, I, I was convinced at the first paragraph, and I didn't need to go on uh, in the paper. And, and I, I, you know, it, it almost, you know, to me was, was beating a, a horse that I thought was really dead, but apparently not. Um, and um, so, and I agree with, uh, I agree with the, obviously agree with the fixation thesis. I agree with the distinction between communicative content and legal content uh, because we can, of course, you know, look at documents, uh, legal documents that are no longer law. Uh, the, the Articles Confederation or the Confederate Constitution or Hamri Rabi's Code or, you know, any number of things where they have communicative content um, but no legal, legal effect. And so, um, and, you know, if there were a uh, a, 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 a coup of some sort, a revolution of some sort, and our constitution was replaced by, by something else, uh, then we could, we could meaningfully talk about the communicative content of the constitution, the same way we, we do now, without talking about legal effects. So I buy, I buy that. Um, I also um, agree that um, the idea of giving contemporary meaning, you know, sort of Putting, putting symbols out there and then letting the symbols take on whatever meaning they, they, they tend to have in the future somewhere. You know, you, you can think of all sorts of terms, not just deer, but other terms that have changed radically in their meanings over time. And it does sound like a bizarre, you know, if you could run a legal system that way. It would be a strange legal system uh, that did that. Um, so... My point is, and I'm not someone who's prone to defend Dworkin. I've, I've spent far, I've, I've felt far too many trees doing the opposite. But I, d I did think that um, you, you, you say that Dworkin rejects the fixation thesis. And I wanted to, to nitpick a little bit on that. Um, so I agree with you in terms of criticizing Dworkin's 
you know, immediate le leap from some of the language in the Constitution to a referent to concepts. I mean, I not only share Steve's worry that, you know, that just because we have a word doesn't mean necessarily we have a, a concept, you know, which, and I think, I, think that's a, I think that's a mistake. But if you look at Dworkin in the reply to Scalia, I would not say that uh, that, that Dworkin or the Dworkin just before that in the Fordham Law Review um, rejects the fixation thesis. In fact, I would have said he accepts it. He's just, you know, the, the fixation is on, you know, is, is the concept. He, you know, the, 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 the semantic intention is to refer to a concept. And um, he, in fact, he, he, you know, he says we have to, we have to look at the semantic intentions of the authors in these cases. So I would have thought, you know, that Dworkin, at least as of, of 2000, is accepting a fixation thesis. He's not very, you know, it, it doesn't constrain him uh, much, and that's, that's the, the point of criticism. But I don't think the point of criticism is that he doesn't accept the, the fixation thesis. There is evidence, I mean, there is a, a period in, in, in the law's empire period where he seems to reject it in favor, but both before and after Law's Empire, I, I think, you know, he, he accepts the fixation thesis up to, <laughs> in a way that doesn't constrain him very much. But he, you know, but I, I, don't, think he, I don't think he rejects it. And so that's just a minor point. And, you know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Steve. So you just have to stop doing this, this, aw shucks. <laughs> I'm asking a question that's too simple and then you ask me about the metaphysics of concepts, <laughs> right? Um, here's the intuition that concepts exist. The intuition that concepts exist is, is derived from things like there are words uh, in different languages that refer uh, to the same thing. So pen in English, fader in German, the words are different, but they seem, right, to be unified in some way, and concept is the thing that does that. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the basic intuition. But what the metaphysics are, and at a deeper level, how all this works, that's just something that I want to try to float on top of, right? So I, I just, it, it, that's a gigantic, super deep question. And I, I, just, I just don't have, uh, I don't want to have to have a position. In the philosophy of language, I have this, my own position, this neo gricean position, right? Uh, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, gives me any problems here with the metaphysics of concepts. Of course, there is a position that says these things do have essences, right? Michael Moore's position uh, in law uh, related to, um, you know, the so-called new theory of reference, Kripke, Putnam, and I, I don't want, I want to sort of not get into the merits of those positions in a paper like this, because I think it can float on top. But I, I hear your question. Um, Maimon, uh, <clears throat> so here, he, yes. Yes, I am trying to separate out these two questions, get people to agree to the fixation thesis, then do the constraint principle later. Uh, conceding on the constraint, uh, conceding on fixation, you might be unhappy with that after you've heard what I will have to say about constraint, right? But, but let me just say this, there's a history here, right? So. In the early 20th century, the version of the interpretation construction distinction that I'm propounding, this is uh, 
interpretation is communicative content. They didn't use that word. They said meaning, but I think it's clear they meant communicative content. Whereas construction is legal effect, including legal content, right? That, that position was very common. You see it in a lot of treatises on statutory interpretation, writing about the Constitution. It, it takes its clearest and most fully developed form uh, in the great treatise writers influenced especially by Corbin, right? A, 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 and then something happens. What happens? Legal, in my opinion, and I haven't done the historical work, so I could clearly be wrong about this, but it appears to me, and, uh, 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 you know, and I really, uh, this isn't original with me, it appears to me that this distinction comes under attack by realists, right, who want a more instrumentalist practice of law. And it's just very inconvenient to have to own up to, well, we think judges can override the Constitution. We think judges can override the terms of the contract. We think judges can override the meaning of the statute. Isn't it nicer to say that, oh, you just have a naive view of how legal interpretation works. Interpretation requires attention to context and policy and purposes and functions. So these results that you think are contrary to the text, they're the true meaning, right? The true meaning according to constructive interpretation of the text, right? So I think that there is a rhetorical ploy here, but I don't think I'm the person who's guilty of the rhetorical <laughs> ploy. Larry, thank you for agreeing with so much. Um, so on, the, on sort of the, uh, you know, what does Dworkin really mean question, uh, you know, Dworkin's own view, of course, is that the actual true meaning of everything he has written is that which makes it the best that it can be. <laughs> so here's, here's how I read the particular texts you're talking about. In the reply to Scalia, Dworkin is operating arguendo. Right, so he is accepting, he was clarifying Scalia's own position for Scalia, saying that Scalia is talking about semantic intentions, and then he has exactly the position that you described. Their semantic intentions were to refer to the general concept and not to any particular conception of that concept. Um, but, Right, he also says in, in you know, there's, there are two texts where he talks about this. And in both places he says, I, you know, now you might think now I'm an originalist, right? Uh, and then he says, but I'm not. I've never accepted that sea laws empire, right? So I think that his ultimate position, so I think the way to understand this is that um, he just, you know, he was trying to trounce Scalia on Scalia's ground, and because Scalia, who's a very smart guy, but nonetheless didn't have this particular set of uh, ideas in his toolkit, he actually, Scalia just knows something bad's going on here, right? <laughs> and that the way that Dworkin is characterizing him can't really be his position, but he doesn't have a way to articulate his own position, right? So that's what my, that, that's what this discussion is about. But I think the real Dworkin, not the arguendo Dworkin, the real Dworkin it, uh, remained at the law's empire position. And I think that's confirmed in justice for hedgehogs. Uh, and, and this is sort of what my paper for the justice for hedgehog symposium at, at, uh, at BU was all about. But it, it is, it, it, like at some level, I just want to go back to my joke. We're trying to figure, pin Dworkin down, 
right? That's a fool's errand. We have, we have uh, six minutes. If we extend it to seven or eight, we can take one more if people observe a one and a half minute rule and, and uh, uh, are, are quick about things. Uh, and that next group is Chris Green and um, Shasira Sanders and John Harrison. So uh, Chris, in a minute and a half. Uh, so what's the modal force of the fixation thesis? Is this necessary or is it contingent? Because I think we have a contingently non-intergenerational constitutional author. Uh, if, it, if fixation is contingent, what are the worlds where it's false like? Shakira. Okay. Um, Shakira Sanders. So I'm wondering, does the fixation theory include interpretations about the scope of the application of the Constitution in the sense that we have a lot of amendments that sort of expand the scope, who it applies to, and, and do we just assume that those amendments sort of become part of what's fixed? And, and so, and it, it, either yes or no, what happens when not all of the scope is fixed in the sense that there are sort of maybe some out there who say, I should be within the scope, but I'm not. Yeah. I don't know if this is the same question, but how does contextual enrichment in time operate with respect to a document that has parts that are added over time? Do the old parts stay fixed because, as Sam Rickless said, the rest of the document is part of the context for the document? Do you read the Recess Appointments Clause in light of the 25th Amendment? And if not, why not? And where does that principle come from? Which side of the fixation constraint line does it come from? Concise and unified comments. I love it. Chris, it's such an interesting question, right? Um, so is there a possible world in which the fixation thesis is not true? And uh, you don't ask the question with accessibility conditions. That is, you haven't limited uh, the, the, the class of, of possible worlds. So if we're just talking about logically possible worlds, then um, I've never thought about this before. But I probably can dream up a world in which fixation isn't true. For example, uh, worlds in which the metaphysics of time are very different. Uh, so I think in that sense, it's not a necessary truth. And if you mean to limit the claim uh, to uh, a much narrower class of possible worlds, uh, uh, worlds that are nomologically and historically accessible, uh, then uh, I think that in all those worlds, fixation holds. Um, but this uh, is something I've never thought about before, Chris, so thank you for the question. I will think about it. It's the kind of thing I love to think about. I don't know if it's making its, it will make its way into the paper or not. Shashira, um, who's within the scope uh, yeah, so one of the, uh, I think that um, uh, who's within the scope um, is fixed as far as the meaning of any particular provision is concerned uh, unless it's modified, right, a la Stephen Sachs. So there have been big modifications, obviously. Uh, the 14th, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, right, are scope modifications uh, and so forth. Um, uh, but the, the meaning of those provisions, too, the, the linguistic meaning is fixed. Now, they're highly general and abstract. So um, uh, their application to particular groups of people uh, may uh, vary over time as our beliefs change. So, and, and this is a big pattern in constitutional law. We have a bunch of pernicious and false beliefs about the characteristics of certain groups when those beliefs change, then the general and abstract language applies differently than, than when we had the false beliefs. Um, so that's the abstract answer to that question. Um, John Harrison, yeah, this is like a great question. Um, I wish I knew the answer exactly to this question. I've, I've, I've never worked on this question systematically. I think it absolutely requires and deserves a systematic, deep, well thought out answer. Um, I, I know a bunch of superficial stuff about what happens when you add things, right? So for instance, you know, we have uh, 
uh, uh, provisions that apply to citizens, let's just take that one, diversity jurisdiction applies to citizens, and then citizenship, let's assume that, it, that the 14th Amendment Section 1 actually changes it, right? Well, then that goes back and changes who can be, a, who, which kinds of parties can give rise to diversity jurisdiction. Obviously, at one time, this was a momentous question. Right, uh, involving a really big case. Um, <laughs> but could there be more complicated effects? Like, can the addition of a later provision change an implicature, implicature, or presupposition attached to an earlier uh, provision? And how would that work? And some of this relates to um, what Akhil Amar calls holism, obviously, right? So I, I just want to say that I accept a modest version of holism. This is, you know, the version of holism that says you read the part in light of the whole, that the meaning of one part can be affected by another part. And temporal considerations may affect this kind of modest holism. Maybe that earlier parts affect later parts in a different way than later parts affect earlier parts. Um, I reject um, uh, extreme holism, and sometimes Akil seems, despite the fact that much of his work is about parsing very particular clauses in particular ways, at other moments he seems to endorse what we might call extreme holism, this is the idea that the Constitution's meaning is just one thing. It's one primal scream, right, uh, uh, which has one whole and undivided meaning. That position cannot be right, right? And I would reject that. And, and, and so that, that has implications for the way things fit together. I, Except modest holism, I believe temporal orderings affect the way modest holism applies. I reject extreme holism. It's perhaps appropriate to uh, quote Einstein, uh, time is an illusion but an extremely stubborn illusion, um, uh, and we're out of time. Uh, so thank you very much for stimulating the question.